All right, welcome to the Rollwise Podcast. My name is Mike, and I'm here with my co-host Brent. Say hello, Brent. Hello, everybody. Yeah, it's been a few weeks since we were in the quote-unquote studio. Uh, we can use the word studio because you guys can't see where, where we're recording, but it's it's definitely decked out. Wouldn't you say, Brent? Posh. Posh studio. Oh, yeah, it's definitely posh. So whatever you guys think posh. about our studio, think of it as posh. Um, and so as you guys probably know, the last few weeks have been the holidays. And as per our normal tradition, uh, we did holiday-like things. And so I'd like to start with you, Brent. Uh, what holiday type things did you do this year? Uh, for us, the holiday, for us, just being my family, uh, my parents, uh, mostly we just uh, hung around, had good food. We had ham for Christmas. Uh, oh. And then we watched, uh, we binge watched um, Alice in the Borderlands was the big, uh, big popular watch, I think, for for my uh, my holiday vacation. Um, it's an excellent series. Right on. Yeah, I, I have to say that, you know, there it's like there's a couple holiday seasonal films that I feel like I, I try to get in no matter what. Um, my wife and I, you know, have a small list, but it seems like it's growing a little bit. Um, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Uh, we've tried to watch Die Hard, it, the movie that takes place at Christmas, but obviously isn't a Christmas it's movie. It's a Christmas movie. Wrong. It, it's a Christmas movie. I, I believe it's a Christmas movie and fuck it's all those Christmas naysayers. Movie. But it's, it's I think that there would be a hard Christmas message to find in that other than ho, 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 I've got a machine gun or whatever, right? Um... <laughs> Uh, it brings families together, boss, f- f- uh, Mike. That's all you need to remember. It brings families really? together. It definitely brings people together in the hate of that one guy that's reporting. God, that guy. He just <laughs> played like such a heel in the 80s slash 90s and whatever it was. You know who I'm talking he about, did. the reporter. Yeah, that exposed he did. Him. Yeah, he's in pretty much everything as the guy that people hate. Ghostbusters. He was the guy like, we're the EPA. We're going to shut this place down. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the Which... same guy. It is the same guy, and that uh, that exchange has my favorite line from a movie ever in it, uh, oh, yeah? where he says, and Dickless here uh, turned off the power grid, and uh, Venkman goes, or, or, or I think it's Ray goes, no, it's Venkman that says, correct, this man has no dick. Uh, and I think that's just a brilliant. I, no, because I think that, doesn't the mayor says, "Isn't that true?" Like, yeah, the mayor <laughs> says, is, "Is that true?" Yeah, that's right. The mayor says, "Is that true?" And he says, "It's true." This man has no day. Yeah, God, I love that. It's just like there's one a few of those movies. That just... One of my favorites in a movie ever. Um, yeah. I laugh about it to this day. Yeah, no, it's like like I said, but there are those kind of seasonal movies that just kind of make the watch list every so often. Um, and I, and I have to say for our, our small little gathering, you know, it's just me, wife, kid, mom came down from, from up North. And, uh, I have to say it was not cold here. Like it was up where you're at. Uh, and I'm, I'm relatively happy that we live in a, a more moderate climate because, uh, I hear a lot of people had their pipes burst, which, uh, sucks for, uh, uh it does, up north. uh, the state that I'm in, uh, there was one part of the state that dropped 27 degrees in 10 minutes. That's chilly. Like that was that was how hard the cold snap was. It went from okay to not okay in 10 minutes. Um it was like a blast freezer apparently. Well, and so, if my if memory serves, wasn't it like but it was like already cold and went to cold or it wasn't like oh this is like 60 going down to 30 it was like negative 10 oh no i think it was no 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 i think it was like above freezing and then below free oh really closer yeah and then close to zero if i remember i do remember it going the other direction pretty just as rapidly i didn't hear about the one where it was like 60 and then nothing yeah it it uh it was it's been a it's been a strange winter um yeah here so out yonder so yeah, so that's that's what we have to say. Holiday movies definitely filled uh, filled our time a little bit. Uh, our our little guy for for those people that care. I'm gonna two two seconds to toot his horn. He uh, started walking, so now I have a little mobile little guy. And obviously, it was a very merry Christmas uh, at our household. So pretty cool. 
Uh, that is, um, that is a good news and a Merry Christmas. And also, just to throw this out there, uh, Alice mm-hmm. in the Borderlands is not a holiday movie. Uh, it is a Japanese a death game movie. So, you know. That sounds pretty Christmassy. I mean, some people might <laughs> might choose the death game over seeing parts of their family, but that that um, is true. There are people that would choose that as their uh, as, as a um, alternate holiday holiday uh, recreation. You know, I I do have to say, and this is one of those weird things, is that you know, me and my mom are very diametrically opposed and politically at this point. Um, and the fact that I banned politics from our house during the holidays, and really just in general when I talk to her. Uh, I think it made for a much better holiday experience. I'm not going to lie. I feel a friend of mine once, and this was at a gaming table uh, when we had a new person that didn't know us. uh, Something was going on. And this was a couple years ago. Something was going on. And this person started talking politics. And my friend said, and I quote, and this is the quote that I use uh, today all the time is, sorry, we don't discuss politics if anybody actually cares. So if you're serious about it and you care about politics, it's probably best that we don't talk about it. Yes. And those people that are interested in politics are going to have to find another podcast because we're not going to really dive into that at all. I hope not. I mean, I guess tangentially there could be some political. True. And and the reminder that we we, we aren't a news podcast either. So, you know. We aren't. But we tempt. But it's just it feels like right now, um, you know, since we're in the gaming space and everything like that, I. I feel like it had been maybe just more tame until the last, until, like until Wizards of the Coast was just like, hey, we're going to start doing this one D&D. I felt like everything was pretty tame. I mean, obviously there were people that were trying to like carve out their niche or make new games. And and I think for me, the the most fun I've had over the last few, um, few months has just been kind of like finding new games, reading about new games, seeing what people have put together. Um, I love game artwork. So, you know, it's just been a, it's just been a process of discovery and hopefully we'll have a chance to bring even more of these games that we, we've been stumbling upon, um, to the, the podcast. But at the same time, like, I feel like once wizards dropped this bomb about, you know, them changing, Oh, we're going to do one D and D we're going to get it right this time. Basically like it just was like just content. Like, I mean, how could you not talk about the shit that they're doing, especially yeah. since, like, I mean, Wizards is just unforced error after unforced error. And people are scrutinizing the shit out of them. Because, I mean, like, if I'm looking at the happy plays, I'm going over to Free League, man. I love their games. Um, oh, yeah, I their games Basin. are really good. Yeah, uh, Basin's good. You just, did you uh, also pick up uh, Blade Runner? I think uh, I think another one of our friends did, but you picked up Blade Runner, I, didn't you? I did not. I did not pick it up. I'm, I'll probably buy it at some point. Um, mm. But I... Uh, our discussion about cyberpunk a couple weeks ago um, sort of fried my brain. And I was like, nah, I don't need to pick up. I don't need to pick up a Blade Runner book right now. Um, <laughs> no, no replicants for you for at least, at least a month or two. Just don't need to pick that up right now. Um, no, the game that I've been mostly interested in right now is um, I think we talked about it before, but it's Troika. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of surreal art uh, game. That's been the one that I've been reading about the most. Uh, and I backed okay. their Kickstarter, and I look forward to getting the new co- new version of the book. But uh, I have a cool. copy of the old version coming. So, well, you I'm have the. About that. It, it's it's not like, and they didn't do like regular sounding editions. The edition that you have, the one with the weird cover, wasn't it like the Numa something edition? Yeah, or? there's the Numinous edition, which is the most recent edition. But they kickstarted for a new edition that is supposed to be going to print soon, and hopefully in my grubby hands uh, in February, I believe. Oh, yeah. So maybe maybe what we'll do is one of our upcoming episodes will be about OSR and like what it is, in case people don't know. Because I think I think right now with with wizards causing enough of a, a hoopla in their core communities, you know, people might be looking for other games. And maybe if they don't know what OSR is, maybe this is the time to share what OSR is. I mean, I, I can't say I'm an expert, but I've liked learning about it in games like Troika and uh and a few other ones out well, there. Troika's a little bit different because it's an OSR field, but like it's not a D20 system either. It's a D6 no. system. So it's yeah. pretty different. But I but I think but, OSR is I mean it might be very related to to D and D but it's I mean it's a, like what old school Renaissance old school role playing old school I, Renaissance yeah or yeah. old school revival is the other one that's pretty common yeah. old school revival 
got a few names in there, but I think it's I think it's kind of like that rulings over rules kind of mentality. So I think that if you look at the the rules, it's probably pretty flexible. So, but I think it'd be interesting to talk about. And then of course, there's plenty of games that kind of take up that space that have that have done really well, I guess, from the people that yeah. have looked at them and then never looked back at D and D, or maybe just went to them in the first place. So. I don't know if anybody, I don't know if, I don't, I don't think anybody ever just doesn't look back, but, um, I, there's a few people oh, here yeah. in the community near us that love that OSR stuff, you know, swords and sorcery, um, a few of the other games, like they, they like them way more than D and D. I just think that fifth edition has more people that play. So they kind of get forced. Well, into I'm it. just saying, I'm just saying, yeah, I was going to say, I just don't think you can ever just not look back, I guess is what I mean. Like you're going to, you're probably going to wind up playing it more often than you think. Yeah, probably. So, um, well, that's cool. I, as for me, I think I've been looking at, uh, I think I'm going to do something with an Aliens book. You know, I've enjoyed Vason enough, but I think Vason is so stripped down in terms of like what it does with dice rolls and all that stuff. And I, and I, I didn't realize I was such a combat person, but like, I kind of like the excitement of combat and like having a, you know, something happen. So I think that getting into the Aliens game might be an interesting way to see how they use that Year Zero engine for something because i can't imagine you would have yeah i guess i can't imagine you'd have colonial marines and not have a way to do combat with it right like i would hope so oh we're Um, gonna i would i would i would i would hope colonial marines succeed a bit more than my uh my hobo yeah well i hope so because well i'm Um, not gonna say your hobo is like hopeless i'm just gonna say it's People have been very unfortunate with their dice rolling in the past. Uh, statistically, in Vason, it's, I mean, like, statistically, you're not going to, you're not going to succeed most of the time. Um, I mean, one six out of six dice. Yeah. Um, it should work out that way on averages, but, and if you're lower than that, it's, it's even worse but anyways but Vazen is fun uh that is an excellent game too i would be interested yeah. to see how they how they run a game that is much more combat in it yeah and i guess what they do with uh alien that i thought was kind of neat was that they um they they have it broken down into two types of play at least as far as i understand um is that they basically have what they call cinematic play which is a pre-made scenario that you know is just you you just like you get everybody together for a night unlike our group probably a pre-made scenario that goes over one session for most groups is going to take three sessions for us because we only get together and game for what a couple hours each week a month and a half. <laughs> it'll take a month and a half yeah um but then you know so you can kind of have that like you can do aliens too you know the scenario of like going down and blowing up the whatever the mining colony um, or you could do campaign play where you know you can actually go through and play you know take those colonial marines go blow up a colony you know go deal with some uh some other people in the universe and like i said i'm actually curious because i don't know what they because i i mean i've read some of the comic books but not a ton are you playing yeah. are, i guess here's what i would clarify on the that game is are you playing colonial marines or is it more of an alien style where you're playing nobody well i think i mean i i think it's got i think it's got both sides you know i don't think that you have to choose to be colonial marines i think i think there are there's a colonial marines operations manual and i think that there's you know there's i think you have a variety of different types of people that you can play you can be just a you know normal corporate miner space navigator rube whatever they call them you know Um, because i'm just saying it would be kind of interesting because well, that's sort of exactly what I was going to say, because like even the colonial Marines in Alien, like mm-hmm. almost all of them die. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I don't it would It would be interesting to see for sure. Well, and the th- thing about cinematic play is that I think I think it's kind of it's it's hard and it's fast. And there's the, kind of the expectation that not everybody at the table could live to the end of the scenario. Right. Oh, so you sure. just. You know, your candle br- burns very brightly, but then it's out. It's out, man. Like, but I'm, of course, I'm just speaking on my perception of what the game could be. I mean, I think that's why it'll be interesting to to play the game. Yeah, I think we should look into it for sure. Yeah. So, but anyways, but anyways, let's talk about the the good stuff. The the looming, the looming. The looming so, so I think what's interesting is that we took enough of a break that we basically missed that D and D. 
uh, fell on its sword and has become the most reviled. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Uh, I think they have a they toe are, dip to do it. Currently, they are suspect of being reviled uh, currently. Um, I believe revulsion is coming upon an actual release instead of a mm-hmm. leak. Um, yeah. It's what, uh, what well, I would say. Well, so what's funny though is that like you you basically you know how you did all those like screen tests and all that kind of stuff for one D and D and all that. I'm kind of curious if they just if they just kind of constantly in that mode and they're just kind of like dropping little like business ideas here and there and then seeing how the community reacts because obviously the community is apparently made up of very like level a, a myriad of level twenty Twitter warriors because obviously there's Twitter activity just layers up any of this stuff happens um but the first news actually comes from the beginning ish of december and that was around the investor call now there was a little bit of talk about this but this is kind of where it becomes it, it kind of calls back to an earlier point we said when we were talking about one D and it's just like one D D is just basically how they plan on making more money from the players and that and we had i think we kind of speculated that there's probably a a, a portion of it that could come through you know, microtransactions and stuff like that. But when the CEO mentions that D and D is basically under monetized and compared to video games, and they're and they basically set their sight on video games as the type of money that they want to rake in, you know that that's going to come with very suspicious types of changes to how they release the content for the game and how they and how they exploit their players because I. I mean, I'm going to take a hard line on this. I think that most of those microtransaction video games are exploitative of their communities. I have not seen one that oh, I are. feel is like, that's, that's good. Oh, no, they are. They totally are. And the other thing is, is um, I mean, you want to talk about reviled companies like EA and some of those other gaming companies, like they are reviled even by their fan base. They're like people buy their games, but they're never happy about it. Um, well, yeah. So I I, did, I hadn't heard the video game part. So for mm-hmm. them to have that have been their quote, that's kind of scary because that is a, um, like I said, that's not necessarily a tale you want to chase, in my opinion. Like EA has made games microtransaction and changes to some of their games that have been like franchise killing. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, so well, yeah. Um. But yeah, under monetized. That is the the key takeaway that everybody heard from the investor call. Um, about yeah. Dungeons and Dragons. Well, and I and I think that that's and I think that that really hurts for me because I mean what that really means is that they're looking to find ways to separate you from your money and and I'm not going to be the guy that's going to sit on a, a a soapbox and say like businesses shouldn't try to make money like that's that's stupid I think that you know business should try to make money but I think that there's that that line that they can cross. And I mean, because there's there's always that argument like, well, what what about people that have discretionary money that want to buy these types of discretionary things for themselves? Like if it's not required to play the game and I'll I'll use Star Wars, um, Knights of the Old Republic as an example, because you can play the game for free. Right. I think they went they went from a subscription model to a free to play game quite early. But I mean, the game stayed around forever because people just kept on buying various cosmetics and then if you did subscribe right. on a monthly basis, you got subscriber perks, right? You know, you basically right. got sprinting and other weird shit that, you know, made the, the game play to win, easier. The, the play to win, uh, the play to win mentality. Like if you pay more, yeah. your character is better than other people's. Exactly. And I, and I think that that happens in a lot of games. Like there was, there were people that were. Oh. <laughs> yes, there's... that happens in video games a lot. Well, and like Diablo Immortal was the one recently that I think just broke my brain. I don't know. Did you ever hear much about that game? I don't I don't think Diablo is really mm-hmm. your No, not Diablo, but like even Hearthstone, like when you if you ever play the the Blizzard mm-hmm. card game, like even that, like you, people got cards by just like you could in theory get cards just by playing the game, but like mm-hmm. it was a lot faster if you could buy 500 packs of cards. Yeah. Well, and and I think that uh, you know, and that's and that's one way to do it. But I think that what they they really like their magnum opus at this point was like D and D or not D and D, but uh, Diablo Immortal was really amazing because you could you could spend a lot of money 
And what was insane about it was is that there were people that spent tens of thousands of dollars and they were like, and they were like, well, it's not pay to pay to win, but you basically, I mean, the game wasn't hard and I, I played it for like a bit and I didn't spend any money on it because like everything was monetized. Oh, you just completed a dungeon. You want to pay 99 cents for this extra dungeon loot box? Do you want to pay 20 bucks for these crests so you could go into the special dungeon and get better loot? Like, and if you look at the difference between spending 20 bucks on doing this dungeon run, which takes about two minutes or four minutes or whatever it is, and you just like see the, the showering of treasures that come versus a person who does it with no crests or like the minimum number of crests, it is like, it's like night and day. And so people were right. people could spend ten thousand dollars on it, and I thought it was absolutely hilarious because they found themselves in a trap where this guy he spent like way more money than you should. He was a streamer, if I remember correctly, and I I don't I don't know. I'll probably butcher the story a little bit or embellish it, but he spent way more money than you should. Like ended up top tier, but the entire purpose of the game is to become the immortal. Like that's why it's called Diablo Immortal, and you get like these special immortal perks and titles and stuff because you're cool and badass. Which obviously he, he I'm sure he's very good at the game, but at the same time he also just spent a lot of money. So it's like right. you you buy well, an unlock, I guess. One of the American definitions of cool and badass is having a lot of money or spending a lot of money. So that that tracks to a degree. Well, and so it's funny, and if I remember correctly, like he spent so much money, got a character so like jacked up that he couldn't participate in the event because it wouldn't match him with anybody to do the event to become the immortal. So that's Jesus. So like, so like he spent so much money and he, it's like, he got so far that it didn't matter. Cause he couldn't do the thing that he was fucking trying to do. It was, it was a little bit of weird irony. And I mean, I don't think he blamed blizzard or anything like that. Obviously it was the first time going into it, but to me it was just like, Oh Jesus. Like that's the one guy, the one type of person that you wouldn't want to piss off the person who spent all the money to get to the thing. And then basically it was like, couldn't get the thing because of like right. programming, you know, they just couldn't, well, they, yeah. nobody else did that. Well, they're going to be like, well, we don't think anybody else. We don't think anybody's really going to spend this much money. And then it's like, Oh, well that guy. Oh my did. God. They, they did spend that a lot. Um, and so, but what's also interesting about that investor call is that they mentioned that, you know, D and D as a, as a brand, um, they're going to, they're going to make D and D more robust. And I, I, what this article that I read on Dicebreaker said was that they were going to make it into a four quadrant brand, um, similar to like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, where they're going to be the game and its books. And then there's going to be the movies and then there's going to be, um, video games, and then there's going to be toys, collectibles, and other things like that. So I think books, movies, video games, collectibles, and hopefully the brand itself is what carries people through to purchase it. Because, and this is this is what probably, I find. Probably they probably should put out a good movie first off. Um, I'm not well, saying that the one that I haven't seen is bad yet, but you're I saying would, Honor Among Thieves. I would bet money. <laughs> Well, th this is what this is what could happen. Like this is and this is where I think that, you know, all these executives could really be in there. Is that if they have a movie that is like really good, I think they're off to a great start. But if D&D &D has a track record of movies, eh, like no. <laughs> like, I know we're going to go see I it cannot, because we need it. I cannot imagine that this movie that movie is going to be good. I can't imagine it's going really? to be good like nothing no didn't it, didn't it have I, I mean it could look i mean I, let's just say it seemed like they are at least trying to go all in and not like and not in a bad way i guess you know i mean it, it feels like it has a lot of the same you know visual effects and stuff like that that you're seeing in other big budget things so i mean it could do well and if avatar can prove anything is that if it gets a groundswell of support, then obviously people will watch it. Uh, the new Avatar is doing terrible. Terrible? I thought it was doing... Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, terrible by comparison to what? I mean, I, I, heard, I heard it needs to make the most movie ever made to be break-even, but well, yeah, is it like almost it's doing, at $1.5 I don't think it's... Well, maybe it's not doing well, isn't it? Uh, as, uh, as in projected. And I'm just basing this off of, like, reading the plot synopsis. 
but who sounds like uh, it's gonna yeah be well no I mean, I, I mean well that's my point is it like is i i think i read that avatar yeah. in spite of the fact that it has i have a question for you uh mike sure what about that warcraft movie oh i didn't watch that that was terrible <laughs> i just it just looked bad like well that's how i feel about this movie yeah well and and i I, I, hey, I'm not saying that you need to like the D&D movie. I'm just saying, will we go watch it and talk about it? Sure. Will we like and it? And their track re- and mm-hmm. their track record isn't isn't very good for D&D movies either, I'll point out. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. So, but I'm I'm really kind of confused as to like, you know, cuz the so if the, let's say that Dungeons and Dragons Honor of Thieves does really good, I mean, are we going to expect like Disney-esque Star Wars releases with Dungeons and Dragons type stuff. I mean, do we want that? I don't know. Um, well, I then, mean, I'm sure, I'm sure Wizards of the Coast does. I, I mean, I could get bored with generic fantasy pretty quick if that's the case. I mean, I didn't. I mean, for all the listeners out there, I haven't even finished Rings of Power. I didn't watch Wheel of Time, and I mean, these are supposed to be the stuff that people are watching, but I. I just can't. I to do it. haven't watched any of those. Uh, I do enjoy Willow, oh, yeah. though. Oh yeah, yeah. You like it? It's, it's not. How many it. episodes are out? Uh, six. I think. Oh, okay. Well, once it's, I, I think I started watching the first episode, and if I, it's interesting because it has that same lady from, I think Solo that did the badass fight scene, the red curly haired lady. I mean, I don't want any spoilers or anything like that, but that seems kind of like a main character right there. Uh, I never saw Solo, so I would have no idea. Mm, okay, well, don't worry about remember, it. Remember, I, remember, I damaged my I damaged my nerd cred by not liking Star Wars. And good job, we just lost half our like listener base. <laughs> oh, not everybody likes Star Wars, but you like Star Trek, though. I mean, so at least you like something you Star. Like, you like Star- Something. Star related, you do like stars, yeah. I guess. You like stars, so so I mean, in basically with that, so to kind of return it back to that article, what what it feels like is is that it feels like they're going to just do probably some things to make money, and it seems like the crux of them making money from the D and D tabletop role playing role playing game and books is going to really hinge on what they can get out of D and D Beyond, and what also seems to be the case is that there's a lot of talk about how dungeon masters, you know, even though dungeon masters make up 20% or less of the total base of, uh, I guess, what would you call them? Players? Consumers? I don't know. Consumers. Um, I think customers. Uh, D&D yeah. customers. Yeah, so they make up less than 20% of the D&D customers. They're the ones spending all the money because dungeon masters like to have all the books. I mean, I, it's a bug that we all get. Um, and D and D beyond well, and is all that, my money because of that. As the as the as the director, you need you need to have the reference material um, mm-hmm. on hand. Most of the players aren't held responsible for that because you, as the as the guider of the game, are kind of responsible for being able to provide and or yeah educate on the rules. So 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 I would feel yeah. really bad if that twenty percent became the new whale population and all the monetization was to try to make get, have them give out more money because there's a lot of people that i know play the game that buy the books you know and they're not exactly like living high on the hog they're just buying the books because they want to support their hobby and all that stuff and i just don't want m a them to be exploited and b uh yeah <laughs> i mean i don't mind if everybody pitches in but i just don't want them to be buying skins i guess that doesn't make the game any better. Right. Just <laughs> I think you're. I, I forget. I think you're. Uh, you're neglecting to bring up the other uh, influx market that they're. They're looking to retool to mon- uh, to monetize D and D, which is uh, a symptom of the new, uh, potentially new OGL license that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, yeah, that's gonna that'll come next. Um, <laughs> heesh. Yeah, and since I, I guess with that being the segue, the next thing we can talk about is this OGL. Now, as a as a comment, you know, I think because it's it's been talked about by people of various things. Um, is first of all, neither one of us are lawyers. Uh, I don't know if you guys had learned that at any point throughout the entire podcast, but we're not lawyers, so anything that we say is just our opinion and shit, and we can't. We it's can't a thought even process. Consult a lawyer. 
uh, kind of a logical conclusion of some things and um, through watching different markets in the gaming community, um, some other things that we've seen, we yeah. can sort of make some kind of intellectual leaps, but we are not lawyers. We're also not a news podcast, even though that, uh, you know, we're going over even though this news. is Yeah, it, it's weird because it's like very topical. You know when this is happening because this OGL stuff. Like, so this is what's weird is I, and this is where I think it's like a strange leak because I mean, when I was listening to some of the people that I listened to, you know, and just kind of like keeping up with stuff, like it feels like multiple people got the same leak, you know, just to kind of spread it out. So either a there's somebody in Wizards or that basically saw this new OGL went fuck this noise. And and basically leaked it to you know get the the fan base into a furor about this, and then Wizards obviously seeing how much they piss people off, then back down. But there's a part of me that said, you know, with how they do this like one D and D shit, what if this was like a planned leak, you know? And they basically said, well, why don't we just give this to a couple people, say it's a leak, and then see what happens? <laughs> well. Um, from a video I just found just a little bit before the podcast, um, before we're recording, I did find one that what they said, um, is they're not, they're a content producer. It looks like, um, another podcast, but they said that, um, one of the places that they got their information was from Kickstarter, Mm -hmm. um, that people kickstarting stuff have to be aware of this. So mm-hmm. it was released to some of the people doing Kickstarter because if you're going to put a Kickstarter up, you have to know that these this OGL is changing. And mm. so they gave it to Kickstarter and leaked it to, gave it to other people who now are leaking it. Mm. Okay, uh, I hadn't well, heard that. It's line. Kind of what I is kind of what I heard um, is kind of the line now. Um, well, but does that mean Kickstarter has a more favorable position than other crowdsourcing? Um, websites? I think there's a couple. I think I think they said they checked with a couple others and they got similar ones. Uh, to hmm. Kickstarter, so don't anybody take that as gospel. That's just something I heard off the internet, and you know you shouldn't believe everything off the internet, um, including us, I guess. But that's what I heard, and that sounds pretty logical to me that it's been released because like a lot of those five E open gaming license stuff mm-hmm. does get kickstarted now. Um, yep. and it might even be a situation where, and I didn't think about this before, but if you are kickstarting an OGL thing, you might have to give wizards part, like Kickstarter might have to actually give them part of the money even. Oof. You know, I don't know. I'd be, I'd be curious because like, so, so I mean, for anybody that's not aware of what we're talking about, OGL is the op- is what is open game license, right? Is that what it stands for? Um, yeah, open game license, yes. And the OGL that Wizards has been using has been in place for 23 years. Um, and it's been fairly liberal. I mean, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, it allows people to be third party content creators without being too intrusive into the process. So, allowing the community to be, do community things and kind of make money, you know, off the, off the backbone of the, D and D brand and everything like that allows you to, you know, use D and D branded things like mind flayers and all the rules and all that stuff to a degree. Like I, I'm not a, I'm not a copyright lawyer. I don't know exactly. Well, if and, 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 and I think the bigger part is using their brand name mm-hmm. to sell your product, to be able to say this subclass for a fighter is compatible with all you know, mm-hmm. with D and D fifth edition, like that's yeah. a big selling point. Like if somebody sees your product and they like it. They're like, Oh, I can use this in our game or whatever. Um, yep. so yeah. Yeah. And so there's, so there's basically a lot of freedom and everything like that. And wizards never like asked for anything monetary before, you know? So, you know, it wasn't like by using it, you had to pay wizards. I think that, I, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details about publishing, but I think if you published through like D and D, what was it? Drive through RPG. Like there were other considerations to publish through there that were, you know, not necessarily 
Wizards of the Coast related, but from just a, a sense of like using fifth edition to create content, you could do it relatively easily and you could kickstart it and you could, you know, if you had a podcast like ours that was much more successful, you could use it as a way to supplement your income. But now that's changing because like the one thing that I think that, you know, I mean, before you get all into the minutia is that they're basically saying with this new OGL is that the previous OGL is like gone. And like, I think that's the, I think that's the one line that everyone's like really confused by because it's like, well, we've been publishing content for 23 years under this game license. What do you mean? It's just gone. <laughs> well, yeah. Mean? And there's terms and there's terms in the original gaming license, like perpetual, like, Mm-hmm. Like you have perpetual okay to you know use this intellectual property, um, yeah. and yeah, I mean, I mean, and yeah, if you've been producing a game for twenty three years that uses a basis of what was once D anD D, like yeah, that would be that would be pretty scary. Like it's a big part of your. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it probably is your income. <laughs> Well, I mean, like I, I mean, I we're we're definitely not the people that have to worry because first of all, like, and this is the part is we at this point don't have a dog in the fight. Neither neither of us are writing any adventures. We're not creating any content related to that. But you know, we're you know, I mean, if you if we wanted to, it would have been much easier under the old OGL because you know we could right have like yeah not. like you could write an adventure, make sure you have their trademarks that they need, they want in their book. Mm-hmm um they want in there and then basically you find a place where you can um you can sell your book i mean the, one of the terms is contributors grant you perpetual worldwide royalty fleeing non-exclusive license with the exact terms of this license mm-hmm. to use the open game content i mean and that basically means like have at yeah to a well and it and the and so like since there's really no there's really nothing it being exchanged it's kind of interesting but when you look at the new OGL and what was being leaked is that it, you know, forced them to create a lot more compliance. You know I mean, first of all, it, in order to use their content, you had to register, right? You know, you had to basically say we were using their gaming content. Second, I mean, it really just limited you to the books. Um, and I don't, I didn't know anything about the OGL because I, I wasn't actually aware. Are there gaming companies that make computer games using, like... The open game license as it was written before? Like, is that a thing? No, because so here's one thing that's weird about like, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but this is layman's understanding of it. Is mm-hmm. there's different types of copyright copyright law. So mm-hmm. like like a game company producing a video game would have to like GW probably or not GW. That's the game that's the company I'm used to talking about with. <laughs> these horrible company conversations um but like i think wizards of the coast they have probably have a copyright that says we own the intellectual property for use of wizards of the coast D, all of these things in video game production um whereas yeah. the open gaming license is for written written content not for mm-hmm. other content otherwise you'd have like D movies and stuff already where like <laughs> you could so it's only them. yeah yeah, it's only a gaming license. It's an open yeah. gaming license. So it's only for games. Um yeah. that's kind of one of the conversations we were having off. That's one of the things that's that's kind of interesting. Like you can file a trademark or copyright um for something and it not be related to um like it's related only to a certain industry, like certain names. Um like I'm gonna be in movies, so I'm gonna copyright this name. Um, and mm-hmm. I'm the only one that can use this name in movies, but that doesn't mean that somebody like some, well, and if it's the real name, there's another matter entirely, but that doesn't mean like you can't make a comic book with a character that has that name or whatever. Um, yeah. I mean, usually they try and cover that, but, but that's well, just kind of, it's a just simple example as far as I understand it. Yeah. And so I think, and I think that that's, I mean, really the fact that, that they nullify the previous OGL is I think the big news here. And then everything has to go on this going forward. Because, I mean, truthfully, like, I don't know how many creators make $750,000 a year on their gaming license, right? Because if you do, you have to pay royalties. I mean, things like Critical Role. Well, yeah, uh, the people that are worried are like Critical Role, Pathfinder, um, 
which apparently is under the open gaming license, which I don't even, I don't really understand that per se, but, um, so like, yeah, like stuff like that, like giant podcasts or giant YouTube produ- content producers. Um, yeah. Uh, that one guy's t-shirt company, um, death saves that one actor's t-shirt oh. company. Yeah. Um, he might have something to worry about. I don't know if he has a licensing agreement with them. Yeah. I, I don't know, but I mean, because I don't really have a dog in the fight, all I can really say is that like, what's, what's weird about them going after this and changing this OGL is to me, what that basically speaks to is that somebody and wizards doesn't, they can't read the room. They're like, well, how did we, how did we become the largest role-playing game on the planet? And one of them said, it's because we have the best game. And then everybody agreed. And then they just forgot about all the people that have like, you know, basically burned up their life <laughs> trying to like promote this, this game as a hobby that haven't been paid by Wizards of the Coast and have only made money through the, you know, the use of like this type of third party content that they create and stuff like that. I just... Well, it's kind of like I, I, this. This reminds me of a few years ago, Games Workshop. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Games Workshop does Warhammer 40k, Age of Sigmar, stuff like that. Um, and I'm an avid war game fan. Um, well, Warhammer fan. I won't say all war games, but Warhammer fan. And a few years ago, G- GW went through this period where I don't remember what company guy that was running the company. And he said, and the, he was on record as saying this, he said, we don't make a company, we make the world's best models. Um, you know, we make the best figures anybody can get. Um, we don't make a game. And so they came out, that was when they first started coming out with Age of Sigmar, and Age of Sigmar was famous and notorious for not having really any rules. Like, there was very basic rules, and like, no rules for like, what armies you could have. It was just basically like, yeah, bring whatever you want, play with your toy soldiers kind of rule set. And like sales for Sigmar were abysmal at the beginning. Um, because you forget when you make a game, you forget that part of it is it's people people playing it and telling other people they're having fun playing it. And so you you have to keep you have to keep your your community in mind. And a lot of times people that want to make money think peasants with money. Or who are buying their product are important, and that's one of the problems I think that they're running yeah. into now. Well, and is... and honestly, like I mean, if if they think that they have the best tabletop role playing game, I, and I know you shared a video of somebody that you know had re, had, must have had an axe to grind against Wizards because they were like, with how Fifth Edition plays, if you want the game that actually plays like this, because this is what you were looking to do. I think they had like a bunch of recommendations for other games and everything like that. And I'm like, and some of them were good games. Yeah. Some of them were, were perfectly great. Um, you know, the great at capturing the feel of what you might be trying to do. And I think that, you know, depending on how this plays out, I mean, first of all, one D and D, I mean that, that in itself has just been kind of like a circus, you know, you go, you watch the spectacle and everything like that. But I mean, it, it I don't think it's going to fundamentally change anything based on how it's playing right now. It seems like it's going to be a, just a, a tuned fifth edition. So it could be a new edition based on how many more changes are down the pipe. But I mean, I don't think that it would, I don't think it would have rocked the boat like fundamentally like fourth edition would have. But I do have to say, if they make all of their communities angry <laughs> for doing well, stuff like this, then. Uh, well, it's, what I think is really weird about a play like this, <laughs> this is kind of what the other thing that I think, remember I said, one of the things that they're trying to do with this this like litmus test that they're trying to do is like stop mm-hmm. people from doing what Pathfinder did, which is like be like, no, nah, we want to play third edition. We don't want to play fourth mm-hmm. edition. Well, <laughs> if they ruin their OGL and so somebody can't make a game of fifth edition um with their open gaming license, they are going to prevent that. Um they think I I feel like might be the thought too, is like if we yeah. tell them we can, they can't make a fifth their own fifth edition game, um, then they then they won't they can't leave us, um, as the famed phrase of all abusive relationships, um they can't leave us if they don't have a better alternative or can't build an alternative, which I just think is like I guess that's true, but they'll just find other games to play. Yeah, like. 
I mean, at some point, you know, you you burn goodwill because there's. I, I mean, again, you know, I don't mind companies making or, money, but. Or what people do is they just play the fifth edition game, like they just play the old game. That is one thing that I think is always strange. Is like everybody's like, oh well, I have to pay the new edition. It's like, well, no, you don't. You can just play the old one. <laughs> well, not probably not on D and D Beyond though. Imagine people like. I mean, I'll be, I'm an example. I put a lot of money into D&D Beyond books so I could, you know, have that ease of tracking and all that stuff. I, I spent more money than I should have. Honestly, I should have spent that money on something else like coffee. Um, you know, and it's, but well, it's like... Well, in retrospect, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But in, in terms of like what that eat means is that you would have to some, keep on feeding that beast. And that's what, that's why I think they're going to, you know, they're going to use this OGL to really hamstring the marketplace for this type of thing because if you want to play D D, you're going to have to do it through people that have pre, some sort of pre-existing agreement in uh, terms of virtual tabletop or go through their kind of proprietary thing and i mean again you know i think people like i mean use discord to like play games and all that stuff and i think that you can do that but i i just don't know what one D is going to look like because there's a sense that some people are going to want to play the newest edition like that everyone there's a lot of people that always move forward with it. I mean, admittedly, we've been able to play what 3.5. Like I have books for 3.5. We could have loaded up a 3.5 game any time in the last 17 years or whatever it was, but we never yeah. did. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, there is that, right? So, it's true. Yeah, but well, yeah. Needless I mean... to say. Uh, it's just I, interesting. I, it's just an interesting take on. I don't know. It's interesting, and like I said, the the newest leak ha- even has a more impact on people like small press stuff. Where like, oh yeah, we could we could pull this anytime we want to. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah, you know we could ruin we could ruin even if you're under you know the scads of money that we think people are making on this. Well, that's a, then I guess that's the other thing is like. There's no tracking of anything like they, they so they actually have no idea how much money is out there. People are making on this stuff. Mm-hmm. They're just kind of assuming. I mean, yeah, I assume like like famous, like big stuff, like Critical Role probably makes, you know, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Sure. But like how many of those are there, do you think? Well, and like and my question is, is like, does that because I mean thought critical role a lot of that money like they had there was a there was something called like the twitch leaks if i remember correctly and they basically put out like who are the top twitch money making people and like critical role was i think like really high up there in terms of how much money was being funneled into them through twitch right and so i mean does that mean that they that has to be reported like i don't know like i thought that that would be interesting to me if like all of a sudden you know, because you're using D and D. Oh, like and does Twitch have to? Does Twitch have to pay part of that because they're streaming D and D content? Oof, oh, that's. Fuck. I don't that, know, man. <laughs> that <laughs> that gets to be all oh, like it's that's the thing is like it's just a slippery, like it's just a lot of ties and things. Because I, I guess it, it, interestingly enough, I do think that like they make enough money they they make some money from their their content but i think critical role makes all their money really from their streaming components so it'll be interesting and i and i think that from my perspective i just i mean i hate to say this and i don't i i'm sure that there's probably good people that work at wizards and that work on the D stuff um but i think this type of move was not made in the best interest of gaming it's like it, like uh, and i'll use beer brewing as kind of an example of a community that is just fucking fantastic anybody that's a home brewer like they are so helpful and so awesome and like local small batch breweries and even the microbreweries and stuff like that super awesome people like everyone is like of the opinion that you brew better the craft itself gets better right like there is a lot of a lot of love there but people turn on some of the breweries and i remember this story happening where like one of the breweries like sued another brewery because they had like trademarked like something IPA or something like that. And I have to say the community's response to the the company doing the suing over the trademark was 
epically bad for that company. And they were not a small brewery, but they got so much hate that they were like, well, maybe it's not worth the publicity to go the route that we're going here. And I feel like that's the same thing that's, that could happen here is that like, I mean, you know, Wizards has done their best to get to this this pinnacle, but when are they going to start punching down? That doesn't look good. <laughs> well, no, and that's exactly kind of what they're doing. I mean, and that's and that's the thing is like, games in general, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Warhammer 40k, just you know, all of that stuff. Like, they benefit so much from people putting content out there, of like just people just being like, hey, this game is so much fun to play. You mm-hmm. should try it. Yeah. Like, and they don't, they don't give enough, they don't give enough credit to that. I mean, when I first decided to play 40 K, for example, like one of the first things I did is I started watching battle reports because, you know, just in seeing other people having fun like that get, helped get me in the hobby. And just like, just like critical mm-hmm. role has done for hundreds of thousands of people, probably. And to, yeah. to, yeah, to like, like just kind of shit on that, those people in that community, it's a bad look and they will. And at times when GW has been bad to their customer base, that they've suffered for it. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, I think we're in a, we're in a place where, especially role-playing games, like there is enough role-playing games out there where you could find another game. Like, do I, do I, do do I love D and D? Part of me loves D and D because it's like the game that that started everything. Like, so part of me loves it. But are there other games that I would play if I thought D and D was shitty, or the mm-hmm. company was shitty? Bet your ass there are. <laughs> I can I can I mean I could go out and find like you said Free League, like Free League has some great stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's not and it's not D and D stuff. It's you know their own rule sets and stuff like that. So I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, uh, and like, like, and that's the thing. So, if like, honestly, if people, if people were scummy about it, then fuck them, then move on. Like, and I, and I hate to say that, you know, as a, as a person who is obviously, you know, done a lot of, has a lot of good memories with D and D and all that stuff. But I mean, I'm not above like cutting off a company that's, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say that th- there's obviously some things that would force me to cut them off permanently. I'm, I'm talking like human rights abuses and stuff like that. I mean, if we found right. that they had those kind of skeletons in the closet, then I might. You found out that they are all of your D and D books are, you know, made in a sweatshop by underage children. That would be, that would be a yeah. deal breaker. Yeah, like I mean, that would be that would be really intense. But I, but like at the same time, <laughs> I mean, they, they, if they they don't need to necessarily go that far for me to put a pause on any future D and D purchases. I'm God, just saying that would be absolute, though, wouldn't it? You'd be like, why are D&D books so cheap? <laughs> oh. Well, little did we know that these are these are hand printed by Uyghurs in China. Oh my god. <laughs> like hand how inked. did they get the hand, hand inked with pink with little pens? <laughs> yeah, and that they're like, you why should, did they get the you letters should, the same? You should see you should see what they do to those children if the letters aren't the same. <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, that that would be like a definite like stop forever kind of thing. Ah, uh, I'll go ahead and throw it out there now. It's now, good we've anybody... assessed one of your one of your limits. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think that should be a lot of people's limits. I don't think I should be alone <laughs> in that one. It's true. I mean, how many people would be willing to pay less for a D and D book if? <laughs> I don't think we need to go there. I don't think we need. We need to go there. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. That's that's probably enough. We for... don't need to. We, yeah, we can we can probably skip that part. Okay, moving on. So, needless to say, the moral of the story is that if if this turns out to just be kind of a shameless cash grab, I'll go spend my money somewhere else and we'll move on. I mean, I'll I'll keep the memories from D and D, but I don't need to I don't need to support a company that shits on this community. So. That's the impression I have right now. It could be I've just totally misread the situation and that it, there's actually a page two to this OGL that is like, but we're really great to third-party creators, and here's all the ways we are. <laughs> that would be hilarious. Yeah, I don't think so. The only good thing is that it doesn't seem like they've released it officially yet, and that's why I said we can't say that they're scumbags yet, is because it's not 100% official. When it is, 
uh, I guess we'll see what happens. But we can and definitely it, like, get the pitchforks ready, though, right? I mean, like, part, we can right, start well, sharpening. It, the internet is made of the sky is falling arguments. So, yes, indeed, that is exactly what we can do. Um, but uh, the thing is, it's like, it's just such a shock. Like, D and D is, and it's the, it, okay. So this is this is the real thing: is D and D is mm-hmm. a safe place where a lot of players feel like it's home, like it's nostalgic, it's fun, it's something we do with our friends. It's very home feeling, and so to have this yeah. kind of like corporate invasion of that, it's really disconcerting. I think is one of the real problems on an emotional level. Yeah, it makes sense. It's just like, how do you monetize your your <laughs> your your happiness i don't know it's a good question yeah you know and like i said what do you like and then then there's all of that like what about you know what are what an actual play is going to do can you not are they not going to be able to stay roll roll a d20 or or cast you know prismatic sphere like like i don't know it just gets and then that's the whole thing is like what what can they control like, what is this actual yeah. control? Because I would say, like, like if they say Pathfinder can't be a thing anymore, I would say 20 years of their own content, 23 years of their own content has to be some argument for it being their intellectual property now. Yeah, it would be, you know, as as much as I believe that uh, Hasbro is ready to go, go to the mattresses with lawyers and all that stuff, I, I have to say that there's... There's enough probably wiggle room in there that I, I mean, lawyers would probably agree that it would be, it would be interesting from a legal standpoint to watch how it gets navigated and all that kind of stuff. But well, that's, you know, it, I think, I think that's what I, I would, I'm trying to, to, to have to, like everyone should keep in mind is big companies will say a lot of things um, in the hopes that people won't call them on it. Mm-hmm. Um, like they will do a lot of business practices that are a little shady in the hopes of, you know, somebody not going like, well, I'll get a lawyer. And they'll be like, but we have all this money. We have all this money that we will throw at you with your lawyer and we will crush you. And they're like, yeah, I'm still going to go for it. Um, and like they will. And, and GW has been guilty of that in the past too. So I know that a lot of like companies like this will do that. And like, mm-hmm. so how much is that? How much is this? How much is this like legal chicken? Like how much yeah. of this is? Well, we're going to put this out there and hope no one says anything. <laughs> Well, I think the problem is, and this is, and this is maybe more props to the community, is that the community is pretty diverse. In the quote unquote fifty million players that play D and D, I'm sure there's a a few copyright lawyers that, you know. Oh yeah, like, there's actually I, uh, one guy. One of the videos I started watching but haven't watched uh, all the way yet is he called his lawyer and has him on the video. He's like, so I called my lawyer, <laughs> and. Uh, He's going to read and he, his lawyer has this big discourse. He's like, I'm more of a general lawyer. I'm not, a, you know, an intellectually property lawyer or a copyright lawyer, but I do have some experience doing general stuff like this. So, you know, I can give you some advice, but I just saw, I just seen another video here a minute ago. Um, what we know and some lawyer perspective and some lawyer perspectives. So this person guy's a lawyer, like out of the 50 million people that play D and D or fans, according to, you know, Wizard mm-hmm. of the Coast, like how many? Some of them got to be lawyers. Got to be. There's got to be. And I mean, there's a there's a there's a, a few people already other that are lawyers and stuff like that that make content on YouTube. So it's not like it's not like it's impossible to see that one of them could be a specialist in copyright. Although what I have seen though is a lot of people are like, well, they either say I'm a lawyer, but I'm not a copyright or intellectual property lawyer, or they say I'm not a lawyer and whatever, just. I'm going to just say things like I'm smart. <laughs> like, much like, like us. We are. We're not lawyers. Yeah, like, much like us. We're not lawyers, but God damn it, we have opinions. And we, we firmly believe those opinions, and we're willing <laughs> to stand by them and swear about it. We're willing to stand by them until somebody offers a different opinion that sounds more legally feasible. That makes more sense, because we're <laughs> also too lazy to get the law to agree. <laughs> I don't know. Lazy. Yeah, well, and too uh, poor. I, I guess mean. I was. I guess that's true. I guess that's why not everybody's lawyers is laziness. Is that why? It couldn't be lack no. of interest. I mean, I feel like being a lawyer could be interesting. I just feel like maybe, maybe that's 
Is that how I'm going to start describing everything? I'm not a doctor because I was too lazy. Yeah, what the hell? Why not? I mean, I don't know if that makes you sound better or the profession sound worse. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just too lazy to have been a doctor. Oh, are you? I'm not, not a, I'm not an astrophysicist because I'm too lazy. Yeah, but I, again, I don't think that makes you sound good in the light. You know, I think, I think anytime you call yourself lazy. It, well, it's kind of one of those backhanded insults, or it's kind of one of those forward insults where it's like, where it's like, I'm smart enough to where I probably could have been an astrophysicist, but I'm just too lazy. See? True. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I definitely had, I definitely had the beginnings, but I, I just couldn't carry through. There's, there's a lot of for the record. Could... Uh, for the record, valuable listeners, uh, I was never anywhere near. <laughs> An astrophysicist degree, a doctor, or a lawyer. Don't you know what? I'm just going to correct the record. This this is the truth. I mean, I don't let Brent sell himself short. He was nowhere near any of those professions. Uh, <laughs> uh, I did have a, a a big hand in making this fine studio from which we're broadcasting today, though. Yep. Um, both of us got got our sleeves rolled up. I think there was something something about elbow grease as well. There was there um, was sleeve rolling for sure. Sleeve rolling. I think like the, this is the innuendo end of the podcast. So I hope that isn't um, a euphemism for something. What rolling your sleeves up? Yeah. Well, yeah, sleeve rolling. Be. I'm curious. I mean, I'm not curious oh. enough to look it up right now, but maybe maybe next week, listeners will find out if sleeve rolling is a thing, or somebody will tell us. Um, okay. Well then I think that's, I mean, that's all I really had to talk about. I mean, in summary, Wizards of the Coast is teetering on a, a razor fine edge of being, you know, I hate to, in games workshop territory. And if Magic the Gathering, it seems to be any indication of how they're going to try to milk this tit for everything it's worth. Uh, I'm not, I'm not expecting anything positive. <laughs> so, well, we both have experiences with large companies, so, yep. um, that is one thing we do have. That is one thing we do have experience with, and uh, we have seen how that can go. So yeah. yeah, hopefully they get back on track, but we'll mm-hmm. see what happens in the long run. Um, true. It probably won't do anything to kill the indie, but it might impact it down a long. You know, it might impact it negatively in the future. So. It's and there will be a lot of content. There will be a lot of unfortunate content that doesn't get made if small companies can't produce or produce third-party content anymore. Um, there's yeah. a lot of good things that will be uh, lost to the sands of time um, because they mm-hmm. can't, unless somebody can figure out a way to market it as under a different gaming system. So. Yeah, well, we'll see. Time will tell. That's as I think that's as deep as I go in that. It will indeed. Yeah. So okay. Well, with that, thank you, everybody. Uh, remember, if you do want to reach out to us and say hello, you can reach us at rollwiseguys at gmail dot com. You can find us on Twitter, which still somehow seems to be alive. I guess. Um, uh, Twitter, Instagram, time. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, you can also listen to the podcast on YouTube if you're that's your preference. Um, mm-hmm. They are up on YouTube as well. So yeah, yeah. So that's that's us. Uh, please uh, let us know what what you'd like to hear. If you have any suggestions for stuff you'd like us to cover, and next week will be a surprise because we didn't think that far ahead. So we will see you next week. Surprise! And remember, everybody, always roll well and roll wise. And see.